is it overrated or underrated? Today, we're posing a number of different topics related to development in general, and we're going to go through them and talk about are they overrated, underrated, or equally rated? I always like to throw that one in because sometimes I just don't care. <laughs> First one, standing desks. I personally have a standing desk and I never use it, but I am a huge fan of standing desks and I'll tell you why. Because standing desks allow you to perfectly dial in the height of your desk and you can keep your feet flat on the floor. Normally, you only have your chair to adjust. And if you can first adjust your chair to get your feet feeling good, then you can move your desk up and down and you're in a good spot. So I'm a huge fan of standing desks, even though I never stand. I'm a fan of standing desks as well. They are underrated for a number of reasons. Even though they are hyped up, people talk about standing desks. What they don't talk about is that standing desks can drop it low too. I like it when a standing desk drops it low. And uh, what I do is I get it all the way to the bottom and then I, I like stretch on the floor while I'm working or I'll sit in really? a little low squat or a lunge. Oh man, I'm, I'd be lunging. That is uh, definitely something I do. And then I'll bring it up. I got a, a walking pad treadmill. I, I start walking. So yeah, stop, drop and roll. I, I do all three on a standing desk. That's for sure. So how, yeah. how long, much, how many hours a day are you standing then? You know, it depends. I, I don't stand all day, especially with, like right now when we do recordings, I tend yeah. to not stand. Uh, reason being, I'm a fidgety ass person. And if I'm standing, I'm going to be just like this on the camera the whole time. So <laughs> I have to be sitting down. Totally. Yeah, I completely agree. I think anything that allows you to slightly tweak your setup and not be static all the time is huge. I stand more than I sit though. I'm right now, I'm probably like 70, 30. Sitting wow. too much, my back would hurt. Standing during the day uh, helps with that. And it keeps my energy up too. Like, because when I'm recording videos, I'm pretty much always standing. And that makes me a little more, I know I have more movement, more energy rather than just sitting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next one, AI-assisted coding tools. For the amount of hype and uh, annoying people online about AI-assisted stuff, I'm going to say they are underrated because the amount of people in the comments on you know Twitter or Blue Sky, whatever, who are so aggressively like, these things cannot help me. I have no room in my life for these things. They are terrible. I think is such an extreme overreaction to where they actually are. I think they can be super helpful in a number of reasons. And like, you don't always have to be using them to vibe code your entire app. There's like a number of things that I think they excel very well at. And I do like that you can feed them the documentation for things. The fact that I can say this is the Svelte 5 documentation and it's always going to use the correct syntax that I want to be using. It's always going to be uh, saving me from potential spelling mistakes even sometimes or yeah. even things like that. This is a stupid thing. But like, I, I think they're underrated for as much as people uh, like to shit on them. So. Yeah, I can't code without them anymore. And, <laughs> and like, melted not your brain. so much that it's a, it's a crutch, but I'm just so much faster with them. You know, like I, yeah. it's similar to like when you used to not have autocomplete or when I don't have my like shortcuts in, in my editor. I'm so much slower and I just want to move so much faster. And you see a lot of people saying that like it makes you less sharp. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Like, I don't feel any stupider. Um, I still feel like I can do all the these things and I still feel like I'm, I feel like I'm learning even more now because I can move so much faster. But I don't know. Do you guys feel like I'm getting stupider? I think the real test is op <laughs> open up VS Code without all the AI turned on and see if you can yeah. still work. Because that, that was one of my experiences. I only recently started using a lot of like AI tools. And when I record videos, I use VS Code because I don't want all the autocomplete to get in the way of like of what I'm teaching. But yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I find that when I make that switch from cursor back to code, I'm just I just pause. I'm like waiting for the autocomplete and then it never happens. Yeah. So then, I, then I have to think about it and actually start writing. But I think that's the test is try to try without it and really see because that's kind of the only way you'll know. I was yeah. writing in a text area the other day and I paused. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is a text area. It's a yeah. text area. There's so many mundane things that it saves me time with that like, yeah, uh, you guys didn't say if they're overrated or underrated, did you? Or I think Wes might have. I haven't yet. I'm just waiting for you guys to stop talking and then I'll get my opinion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go you, for it. When you're with Wes and Scott, you're never going to get that chance. No, you got to get in don't... there. Yeah. yeah. I know. They're underrated, by the way. Full vibe coding is overrated. I think only, only using AI tools is overrated. Um, 
And I, I think the hype itself is overrated. And I think that's what causes a lot of this yeah. rage online is because everyone's, well, I don't want to use it at all. But like, there is there is a middle ground. I, I am I am Mr. It Depends, and I have found a space for AI in my workflow. Yeah. And I, I absolutely think that if you're not at least learning how to use these tools, like you're going to get left behind. Yeah. But I think there's a good middle ground. I don't think you should go all in. I think you should find the spots where it makes you faster and then use it as a tool because that's what we do as developers. We find exactly. the stuff that makes us better at what we do. The amount of obnoxious people, yeah. all, the, all the thread boys that have courses and all the stuff that think that you could build like a Calendly or Riverside yeah. in, in a couple of prompts are yeah. so out to lunch. You're going to get There's comments about that here. So class. much more than that. Yeah. And that's that's probably why it's leaving a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. I'm going to tell you what, both sides are way too sensitive on this topic. I, I think it's crazy the amount of people who are like, you, you say anything even slightly critical about it and they wet their diaper like instantly. It's crazy. <laughs> and uh, speaking of writing crappy code with AI, Sentry is here to help. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, if you are using these AI tools, uh, it's you're bound to get some, some bugs in your code. Definitely check out Sentry. Sentry, sentry.io slash syntax, you'll get two months free. If you get any bugs or things happening in production, you can run the auto fix and it can a lot of times one shot your fix while just seeing what error you got. So definitely check it out, sentry.io slash syntax. And uh, we thank them for uh, letting us do what we do here. So next up is .env files. Are they overrated or underrated? I think they're highly underrated, especially mm. like you, you come across a project that doesn't have any sort of documentation or way of knowing what needs to be configured locally, yeah. it's really hard to get that set up. So I like the idea of having .env files because then each developer can specify their own keys, specify their own connection information, and then it works for, for each dev that's trying to work on a project. Honestly, I don't I don't know another way around it, right? Otherwise, you're like, you're committing stuff to your, your repo. You don't want to commit secrets there. So env files are, are, are good for that. Yeah, I'm curious to see if you guys have reasons why we shouldn't use it. Yeah. I, so I use them and I'm always a little bit like, hmm, should we really be putting like we spent all this time on security, all this time trying to limit two factor authentication and, and all of the stuff. And then you just put an API key that can access in unlimited open file, yeah. AI requests in a yeah. text file. There are several other tools out there that will start, sort of just inject them into your environment as you start to run your thing. I'm, I'm, I like them, but I'm, I'm always a little bit weary of like, yeah, should we really be putting just these in or it's, it's equivalent of just putting a password in a, in a text file in your, your Google docs. You like, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't put your email password in a, in something like that. So why are we doing that with, with API keys? It's kind of yeah. tricky, right? Yeah, it's tricky. You know what? I would have instantly said they are accurately rated or underrated before using SST. And I got to say, like something the way SST does it, where that doesn't store that in any file, it's attached directly to your project and it's... Um, you don't have to worry about that. And then therefore, anytime you're in a development environment, those things are just saved. I believe it's saved to AWS or wherever exactly. I don't even know the exact mechanism, but it doesn't exist as a file. And then it's automatically it exists loaded. exists in a third party's database. But <laughs> encrypted safer. if it is. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> either way, it's not sitting on a text file somewhere in my, my desktop totally. or whatever. And I don't have to keep track of which ENV file I'm loading. I don't have to have env.prod, env.development, any of that stuff. It, yeah. Yeah. I also hate that, like multiple .env.dev, .env.prod or whatever. Don't yeah. keep your prod creds in a .env file. Those should go in your like hosting provider. And if you do need to keep a backup of them, then you should be storing them in like a secure note and like one password, something like that. Yeah, it Word. all depends too, because yes, you're you're writing that those environment variables in a file, but technically once they're read in, they're in memory. And so if there's any sort of exploit where like remote code execution or something like that, it can still read those even if it yeah. doesn't have files. They're system still access. in memory. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're still in there. So it's really just what layer of security do you want to have in your app? Totally. They're all better than just hard coding it. So well, just yeah, never, uh, <laughs> never do that. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Uh, let's talk about fussing with your setups. Is it worth your time to customize your theme, customize your CLI prompts, window management? You could spend your entire day 
just working on your settings for your computer. And a lot of people say that's a absolute waste of time. What do you think? Uh, here's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say it's underrated because if I say it's overrated, that would be very deeply troubling to my ego because I spend way too much time fussing with my setup. <laughs> I gotta say, there's just something so nice about having your stuff dialed in. Um, yeah. I, I love my, my color schemes. I love it when I open my text editor and just be like, ooh, that's nice to look at. I'm happy to be here. That makes me feel good. All of those things, I like that. So I'm gonna say it's underrated because, hey, I, I like tweaking my stuff. You're a tweaker, Scott. That's yeah, good. I'm tweaking it. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. a I'm a big tweaker as well. I absolutely care a lot about what it looks like. If I get like annoyed by how my window management works, or I have to click too many buttons to make something work, you better bet I'm stopping and and firing up Better Touch Tool or a Carabiner Elements or something like that to get a nice flow set up for it. So I care a lot yeah. about how it functions and how it looks, and I think that makes me a better dev or at least a happier dev at the end of the day. Yeah, maybe not better, but happier for sure. CJ, what do you think? I think fussing with it too much is overrated because I think a lot of people can fall into the trap of like, oh, if my theme just looks nicer, I'm going to be a better dev. Or if I can just type 10% faster in my Vim setup, I'm going to be a better dev. And I think like I've definitely spent a lot of time in my career like figuring those things out, but I've kind of arrived at a setup that works for me. And then I, I just spend less time tweaking it now. Like the Mac setup video that I released like a little over a year ago here on the Syntax channel, my yeah. setup is pretty much exactly the same a year later now. Mm. Of all the things, it is the one thing that you have the most control over. So I think that's why people, a lot of people spend time on it. Like at your job, you don't necessarily get to choose what framework you're working on or uh, like what exactly you're building, but you do get to choose what editor you use and what terminal you use. So people like that amount of control. Yeah. I just say, find out what works and then stick with that. Don't spend too much time tweaking it after that. Mm. That all tracks. Yeah, I spent, I spent a whole day trying to get aerospace the the window manager up oh, and running bro. and i got mm. i got or maybe even more than a day like i made a couple of videos explaining what i was working on and people really liked that and i ended up just scrapping it at, at the end of the day it's just yeah. too brutal fussy, too it's much brutal it's the only piece of software i think it's made me like really want to flip my desk over in the past <laughs> several years <laughs> i i felt that way as well but i was like whenever i hit something like that i'm like like I might be wrong. I might be wrong about this because like, I don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, that's always, I've always hit command F and it always worked that way. You know, like maybe there are better setups. So I gave it like a, an honest shot, but it was, I logged a few, I even committed to the, the repo. I, I, I learned to write Swift. That was the first line <laughs> of Swift I ever wrote as a patch for it, but couldn't, couldn't hack it. Yeah. Next one here is MCP servers. We just did an episode on MCP, MCP being the way that, uh, it's a protocol for how AI agents talk to services, right? Whether that is like APIs like the YouTube API or whether that is Sentry to be able to ask AI things directly questions about your specific Sentry account with your login credentials, etc. Um, yeah. I think MCP is so early days that it is underrated because most people probably don't know what it is. And a lot of people yeah. are burying their heads in their sand with this kind of stuff. And it's overrated for how well it functions currently, but that's mostly probably the fault of the immaturity in the eco space. Uh, so I could see this as being like the start of, you know, how we use these tools in a, a more real way that's like less surface level asking it questions, but more or less taking over things that we do every day. Uh, you know, automate these cuts for me into Vinci or automate this or that. I I think it's underrated in that regard. I, I just wish I could get it to work better, um, more reliably, I would say. Yeah, you hook anything to anything. Like for example, I use the Playwright MCP server and I said like open up syntax.fm, go in the terminal, see if there's any council errors, run accessibility test, take a screenshot and then and then close it down. And it, it all worked amazingly well. And being able to just pull in six or seven different services and have them work together without having to spend forever wiring absolutely everything up is going to be huge. And here's my hot take is that it might be the downfall of the internet. Yeah. So yeah, dead internet I for am sure, yeah. absolutely yeah. exhausted 
by my email right now is I get, I don't know, seven or eight emails every single day with people faking having listened to the podcast, having read my blog, just being like, hey, can we do X, Y, and Z with you? And it's I'm so exhausted by the amount of just spam and slop that's coming in. That's what with people that are pretty dialed being able to make these tools to try to make money from them. When it becomes as easy as, oh, I I installed these three MCP servers and now my email talks to my school, I can automatically click things and, and I have it hooked up to my iPhone. I think we might be doomed. Yeah. Um, I think technology might just <laughs> yeah. be ruined when you can, because like like money ruins everything. And I'm, I'm kind of worried when anybody can simply make anything, it's just gonna, all hell is gonna break loose. Yeah, that's my yeah, my that's pessimist. Yeah. yeah. The idea of like connecting services is huge. Like being able to stay within one chat window or within your editor and then it's like reaching out and 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 doing things for you. But I think the other key point here that is underrated is providing context because working with AI it's context, context, context. The more that the prompt can know about what you're working with or what you're trying to do, the yeah. better the results are going to get. And that's also what M MCP um, or M model context MCP servers can do. Which is like, if you ask it a question, it could literally go pull search results and then add that to the context, like from the web. Or if you ask it about your GitHub issues, it could go get the context of your last 10 issues. And then now it has that when answering your question. So being able to pull in data with all of your prompts, I think is huge. Like it, it just makes it that much easier to get better results from AI because because context is key. Yeah. So next up is RPC or remote procedure call. And uh, we want to talk about, is it good for type safety? Is there too much coupling? Is it overrated? Is it underrated? And essentially, this is a way of uh, communicating between a client and a server. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. So like TRPC uh, popularized the idea of having TypeScript types both on the front end and the back end. Svelte Actions let you do this by basically just submitting form data and then being able to instantly use that on the back end. We get this with React Server components and React Server uh, functions and actions that basically make it really easy to communicate between your front end and your back end. So what do we think? Mm -hmm. I think it's underrated. I, I think like full stack type safety is huge for developer productivity and also just like documentation in general. Being able to not have to context switch when you're working yeah. in back end code versus front end code is huge. I think it, it, it applies to a specific type of application, though. Like, I don't think everything should be built this way. But mm -hmm. if you're building an app that just in general is going to be coupling front end and back end, I think I think it's huge and, and really good for productivity. Yeah, I totally underrated. I don't ever want to have to write a REST API or GraphQL API unless I absolutely need to. Like you said, like you said, we might need a mobile app as well. And, and even then, like just, I don't know, export me some RPC client that I can just, mm. just interface with it. You know, like it doesn't right. open API do something similar to that. Exactly. Yeah. I just want to write a function and then call that from the client and I want loading and I want error states and I want all of that stuff as fast as I possibly can. I don't want to have to fuss with like making a whole API. I've, I've done that for too many years of my life and I'm a big fan of all of these RPC implementations. Yeah, for me, it's permanently cuffing season because I want coupling all the time. I, I, I seriously like, I like this stuff. Uh, I come from the land of Meteor where, uh, you know, you're writing fake MongoDB calls on the, the UI to grab your data from. And I like that so much. I wish I could do that all the time. I prefer the Svelte implementation, obviously, uh, because it's Svelte and, you know, I'm a... Uh, I don't know, I'm a homer for, for Svelte things, but uh, personally, I really like that flow of using browser real standards and whatever behind the scenes, but you know, in your code, it's just like, hey, just use this server function. Here's the name of it. Now in the server function file, just write your server code. You know, like, what's up with that in like WordPress, right? What's up with that WordPress where like in WordPress, you get the UI and it's all tightly coupled, yeah, you know, whatever. And then there's also the API that just exists with your data. I like that. Or even Drupal, right? Yeah. And it, it shows not a lot of people go straight for the API. They they prefer the tight coupling. Same with the Shopify. Shopify has a whole API. They have a whole React thing. And most people are not using that. They're using good old liquid templates because it's much more tightly coupled. So it's a lot more limiting, but 
I don't think a lot of people care that much. Well, that's it for this rousing game of overrated or underrated. I don't know if you can call it a game, but as always, overrated, underrated. If you have any topics that you would like to see us cover in overrated or underrated, drop that message below. Let us know what you want to hear, and we will catch you in the next one. Peace. Peace.